Hey guys, Woodruff here. So we are getting deep into cardiac and as we are have finished vascular disorders, now we are going to get into disorders that are all about the heart. Um, so this part of the lecture is going to start getting into cardiovascular disorders. Um, this particular lecture will be over coronary artery disease. So like I said, we're getting into different cardiac issues. The next um, disorders we're going to do, this um, lecture will be over CAD or coronary artery disease. Remember I said all of the cool, um, uh, what do you call them, disease processes get an acronym because they're cool as a part of the cardiac uh, fraternity or sorority, whatever you want to look at it. Um, but we have CAD, we also have CSA, which is chronic stable angina, that's the next lecture, and then hypertension, and soon to come to you um, is dysrhythmias and then heart failure. Um, those will be different lectures. So there's a, this is a pretty cool video um, that they have over um, showing like how plaques, but I can even just stay on this picture. Coronary artery disease, um, I'm going to talk about it on the next slide, but um, it's effectively where plaques accumulate um, in the arteries. And this is going to be different than any other disease that we've talked about so far, um, because it's not actually a disease with symptoms like that someone's going to complain about or experience, um, but it's more about like pretty much like a huge risk factor or a huge problem is building in the body. And that huge problem is a plaque problem. So just like we talked about PAD or peripheral artery disease, CAD um, also has um, a lot of very, um, you know, negative consequences where it can lead to, um, you know, as it gets more serious, um, it can lead to more serious things like angina, um, heart attack, uh, MI, uh, things like that. Oh, got this. All right. So like I mentioned, this is the same thing as PAD where there's a flow issue and there's a flow issue because there's narrow, stiff, rigid arteries. Um, and those are going to be specifically the arteries that supply blood to the heart. But there's also an issue with plaques um, building up. So we have too much plaque. Um, uh, we call them vessels that are getting very narrow. So um, once again, we have a problem here where we have like these, like I, I gave the analogy in the other um, uh, PowerPoint about we have this um uh, what do you call them? Like these pipes, like, you know, like when you take a shower and you're washing your hair, they get clogged mm -hmm. and we have a similar kind of thing going on here. Um, and so uh, what do you call it? When we're looking at um, these patients, you know, we're, the end thing, you know, with PAD is we're worried about that leg or feet ischemia. Um, you know, what we're worried about with CAD is going to be complete blockage of the coronary arteries. And if my coronary arteries are not supplying my heart with um, the much needed oxygen, um, we can end up with a heart attack. Um, as time goes on, just this can happen in the legs too with PAD. Um, the body can create collateral circulation and can say, hey, you know what? Kind of think of like if you're on a road um, driving to work and you see, man, every time I take this way, there's so much traffic. Uh, I'm going to start finding a different way to go. Like the body does the same thing, but it has to do this over time. It's not a quick, um, it's not a quick fix. Um, so what can happen sometimes with CAD is, is that there's a really sudden or quick, um, uh, what do you call them, a uh, blockage or plaque accumulation. It's not that the plaque's accumulating fast, I should say, there's like a plaque rupture, um, which can lead to clotting and um, block, acute blockages. And so it doesn't have time to form that collateral circulation. That's really what a heart attack is. Now, I do want to clarify this. CAD is not a heart attack. Um, there's We're going to talk about this, but there's usually no symptoms. Um, but it, it is um, a very high risk to have CAD to then uh, end up having a heart attack. Um, so uh, risk factors for coronary artery disease. And um, as we're getting into these cardiac disorders, you really want to pay attention to risk factors. I mentioned in one of my last PowerPoints that when you do risk factors, you want to count. So let's say that we had a um, you know, test question that had a person with um, you know, like four or five different parts of their story. I want to count each part of their story, whether it's their age, their gender, their race, um, their lifestyle habits, um, labs that we have for them, whatever it might be. I want to count exactly how many risk factors that they have. Um, so... 
um, things that we can change um, are going to, uh, uh, sorry, things that we cannot change that are non-modifiable are going to be things like age. Um, I can make myself look younger, but my age is my age um, based on my genes and how long my body has been on this earth. Um, uh, certain genders are more at risk. So when you think CAD, um, it's usually going to be middle-aged white males um, and um, then also having a family history. Um, the next uh, types of, those are all things that I can't change. Um, it's in my genetics, et cetera. Um, so if I have that, but there are things that we can modify. Now, some people get confused with modifiable risk factors because they're like, hey, wait, I don't get it. I can't really, mod I can't modify the fact that I have diabetes. There is no cure. We're not modifying them in the sense that we're getting rid of them. Modifiable means I can make it better. So these are all things that we can improve upon to decrease someone's risk. Um, so high cholesterol, we can modify that with medications, with diet, which we'll talk about um, those medications coming up here soon. Um, high blood pressure, we can modify it um, by, uh, we call or make it better by um, medications, um, treating the hypertension, diet changes, exercise, et cetera. Diabetes, we can uh, manage it well with medications, uh, diet, exercise, depending on the type of diabetes. Um, smoking, you know, the smoking is actually a factor that they say that if you, um, like you can significantly decrease your risk for coronary artery disease um, by quitting smoking. So even if you have a history of it in the past, you can um, significantly, uh, it just kind of like with PAD, it's one of the best, um, what do you call it, um, things to like modify or change. Um, it's a very similar here. Smoking can make such a big difference um, and increase your risk significantly if you're still smoking. Um, sedentary lifestyle. So we can modify that by getting moving, uh, and then obesity, we can, uh, lose weight, things like that and stress, uh, modifying job or other life circumstances that may be getting in the way. And people really underestimate how much stress, um, can play a factor in cardiovascular disease. So, um, like I mentioned before, a patient with CAD usually has no symptoms, um, and if they are starting to have symptoms, they have CAD maybe, but they also probably have angina as well, or what we know is CSA, which we'll talk about in the next PowerPoint. Um, think of CAD like prediabetes in the sense that these patients effectively are at risk um, um, for much bigger problems like a heart attack. Um, so these people don't, like people with prediabetes, they don't usually have symptoms. Their labs maybe don't look great, um, but it's not enough to necessarily get them to the point where they, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, they're going to, uh, you know, be fully diagnosed. And so CAD is um, very much like a pre heart attack or pre uh, problems with the heart. Um, so you can really kind of look at it like that. It's a, it's a series of um, it's, it's a plaque building problem. And that's effectively um, what's going on is, is that we're going to look at this patient's labs. We're going to find that their cholesterol and stuff is elevated. Um, there's signs of problems building up. Uh, we caught, um, you know, like, cause we can actually go in and see that plaques are building up in their coronary arteries, but there's no actual blockages that are going on yet. There's just a buildup. Like, you know, there's like, we're like kind of a problem is brewing here. Um, there's no ischemia or cell death or elevated um, cardiac enzymes. Like there's none of that going on. They just have plaques um, and um, uh, what do you call it? Their cholesterol levels may be high, et cetera. Uh, and so, um, yeah, the biggest thing we're going to worry about is um, them getting a heart attack. So they're getting better if they have no symptoms of a cardiac event, like no chest pain, MI, and if their cholesterol is improving, things are going to be looking worse if they have chest pain. Um, or, um, you know, it looks that's again, starting to have a symptom, they had no symptoms and now they're having a symptom. It's going to be worrisome. Um, there's also going to maybe be signs of decreased oxygenation and, or perfusion, which really they go hand in hand. So I shouldn't say, and, or, and perfusion. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we're going to be looking for signs like where they could actually, um, be maybe having more difficulty, maybe decreased saturations when exercising or moving, uh, maybe um, signs of poor flow to their extremities, things like that. Uh, they might also, like I mentioned, have worsened activity tolerance, which means that they're going to have trouble like moving and breathing at the same time or doing like even activities of daily living might be too hard for them. So let's talk about labs. There is um, now I'm about to dump a bunch of labs on you. So um, try to keep up. I know it's hard. The best thing I can say with these labs is you really need to put them into situations and scenarios so that you can um, 
Uh, see, get meaning behind them. To, if you just memorize labs, all you're doing is memorizing numbers. But if they don't have meaning to them, they can't really help you when you're on your exam because we're testing you over situations. So you could look and you could have like a question that has four labs. You could say, oh, that's high. That's low. That's normal. That's high. Um, okay. But then what? You have to know what's next. So um, really start to make meaning around these labs. So some labs that we're going to get for CAD are going to be um, about like, hey, um, you know, if I'm accumulating plaques, do I have high cholesterol? So we'll check things like a lipid panel. Um, we shouldn't, but, um, you know, the if the plaques get bad enough, it is possible that we could have ischemia, damage to the heart muscle. Um, so we might check cardiac enzymes. Um, then we also want to check, you know, especially if they're diabetic, we want to see what their glucose regulation is like, what their hemoglobin A1C is. Um, and remember for a diabetic, we like it usually less than seven. You know, some agencies say less than 6.5, but usually a good standard to go by is less than seven. Um, and then the potassium and the magnesium, um, those are your normals there. We want to check electrolytes. A lot of times when there's issue in the heart, um, part, part of it is, is we want to make sure like we don't want anything else irritating the heart because I already have less flow there. Um, but yeah, definitely things can uh, get off for people that are having heart problems. So we want to keep a close eye and keep everything we can stable so we don't contribute to a worsening problem. So let's talk about lipid levels. Now, any labs that I have on here are per the most recent textbook that we have. And so um, hopefully I shouldn't have to spend too much time uh, um, updating these in the future where I need to sit there and be like, oh, you know, like there's all these, um, uh, what do you call them, uh, new labs and stuff like that. But these labs can possibly change as times change. They have since I started teaching. Um, but these are the most recent ones. And these are the ones you want to go by. Um, in our new textbook, there is some... Um, there's a page on, um, and I don't remember exactly what the page number is now, but there is a table on one of the pages um, and it says something with one of, like, I think with the good fats where it says we want it, um, you know, a 40 and 50 instead of 45 and 55. But I got to tell you this, at least for my school, I can't tell you for your school. These are the numbers we go by. This is what's in the back of the book. This is what um, as a whole in our diagnostic session for section for cardiac um, talks about. So these are the numbers we're going by. So these are the ones you want to know. But again, we want to bring meaning to them. So what is, um, what's the big deal with lipids? So lipids, um, you know, th this is a measure of how much fat is accumulating um, in the arteries. And what we want to look at here is, um, what do you call them, the uh, we, we want some of them to be low because we want, you know, we don't want bad fats. And then we want some of them to be high because the good fats can help outweigh the bad fats and decrease our risk um, for more plaque accumulation. So our, there's three bad fats. There's the LDLs or the low density lipoproteins, um, triglycerides, and then total cholesterol. So the LDLs, we like them less than 130, um, triglycerides less than 150. And again, you might see in some places like women versus men, but the general, you know, we want to keep triglyceride, triglycerides less than 150. Um, total cholesterol, we like less than 200. Anything that's above those numbers is a sign of, um, you know, elevated cholesterol. Just because someone has an elevated LDL doesn't mean their triglycerides are going to be elevated. So everyone's a little different, depends on their diet or other problems. There also is like family, um, related tri, uh, hyper triglyceridemia. So sometimes people, everything else is normal, but their triglycerides are just high. So, I mean, it, it just varies, but just know that any of these being elevated is a sign of, you know, fat accumulation, probably plaque accumulation. Um, we also have good fats. These are the ones that we want to be high. And so I always remember LDLs. We want them low. They are the loser. Um, we want them um, to be a low number. Whereas our good fats um, or HDL, they're my happy, H for happy, high. I want them up. Um, and so for, um, and this one does have a difference for men and women. I would want to know this difference. If we give you a scenario, um, men is greater than 45 women, it's greater than 55. Um, so yeah, so those are our lipid labs. Now let's talk about heart damage labs. Um, so for the, um, for the heart, what we are looking at is we want to consider, um, is like we said, it's kind of like, remember in PAD, when we are looking at, Hey, I have, um, narrowing, I have, um, plaque accumulation, but how's my peripheral neurovascular assessment? This is, um, you know, we can't check a peripheral neurovascular assessment on the heart, but we can see is if there's damage happening to the heart. If I get such bad flow, um, to my, um, heart that there is actual cell death, I'm really starting to have an issue here. And so, um, if there starts to be ischemia, it starts to get very um, wound up or uh, painful. So um, you want to look here at these um, labs. 
clubs, uh, you know, so there's a troponin I and a troponin T. Um, and I'll tell you, here's the thing is, is if we give you a troponin on the test, it's either going to be elevated or it's not. So don't get hung up. We're not going to give you one in between or one that's super low. Um, but like, you have to be like, Ooh, is that an I or a T and figure it all out. Um, just know that, um, when it comes down to it, like really your troponin should not be elevated at all. Um, and when it gets elevated, it gets pretty high. Like I'm talking about, you know, um, in the teens to 20s, 30s, 50s, hundreds, it can get up there. There's also a lab called CKMB, which um, the normal is less than four to 6%. Um, and that's a measure. It's a little bit more specific to the heart um, than the regular CK, but um, really troponin is our golden standard. It's the lab we're going to uh, get most often on patients. Um, it, it pretty much what it does is it tells us that somewhere in the heart, there's some, um, you know, sick or dying tissue or some hurt tissue. Um, and um, it can show that cell death within a few hours. But the problem is, is that troponin stays elevated for a while. It takes a while to come down um, from its high level. So, um, you know, that's why we trend these is effectively, I'm looking to make sure they're going in the right direction. But let's say I had a person who had a heart attack, their troponin is 120. The next day it might be like 116, 115, you know, maybe a little bit lower. I'm looking for the direction it's going. I'm not looking that it's back to normal. Um, and so, and this is usually exactly what we need, but what can happen sometimes is, is that um, a patient can come in, have a heart attack or some other damage to their heart. We can go in, do an intervention, reopen things, um, get things sorted out. And then we can, um, uh, you know, um, be watching them and they could end up like, you know, the, if they got a stent placed, it could reocclude or something else could happen. And um, we want to sometimes know if there's a new damage going on. Now, if someone like had a second heart attack or a blockage in another area, um, you know, there are other ways, of course, to start looking at that. But what we're going to be concerned concerned about is the troponin still elevated. So it's hard to tell um, with the troponin if the patient's having a new or different attack if they um, their troponin's already elevated. The CKMB, it also goes up um, pretty early and um, starts to show damage. But um, the great thing is, is it usually goes back to normal within like 24, 48 hours. And so if someone came in, had a heart attack, but then started to have a second heart attack after, troponin is going to be harder to tell that they're having that second heart attack. Whereas um, because their, their troponin is already elevated, but CKMB could be back to normal. And then if it has that rise again, it kind of tells the doctor, Hey, there's a new blockage going on here. Now I don't want you to get too confused with this as a whole. We get both of them. We trend them. Um, we just kind of keep an eye on them, but, um, troponin really is going to be your golden standard above everything else. Um, and, um, it's the one that you're going to see most often used. There's also some diagnostic testing, like is there narrowing um, causing like ischemia or changes to the electricity in the heart? And, um, you know, like the effectively what you want to think of here is, is that a, we'll talk about this when we get to dysrhythmias, but um, a lot of dysrhythmias are caused by lack of oxygen um, or, um, you know, issues where the, the heart's not functioning right. If my um, heart wall tissues, everything, et cetera, is not, uh, yeah, not even, I don't want to say heart wall tissues. If my heart, my beautiful heart is not getting a uh, good blood flow, then how is it the electricity system supposed to work? So like, I mean, everything has to live off of oxygen. And so um, if I'm low on oxygen, my electrical system gets really irritable, which can lead to dysrhythmias. The other thing I want to look for, because there's two things you want to look for in EKG. You want to look for dysrhythmias. And then also when we're talking about things like coronary artery disease, I want to make sure that there's not signs of ischemia and we can show this. Now we don't talk that, talk about them at this level too much. I do have videos for my complex class, um, you know, that, um, uh, that, that for the complex class, it's not mine. Um, the cl complex class about MI, cause we don't talk about MI this semester. Um, but effectively what we would be looking for there is what's called ST elevation. Um, and so we're looking for changes because what happens is when the heart gets enough damage, the electricity itself starts changing in response to that damage. Mm -hmm. We might also get an echo and that tells, um, you know, is the heart muscle pumping okay? Um, despite the narrowing, we're pretty much looking, how is the narrowing affecting all the functions of the heart? The heart functions the electrical system it has a heart. The heart has a functioning muscle or mechanical system like the muscle pump. So we want to see if each of these is affected. Is my heart squeezing any differently as a result that it's getting less oxygen? Is my heart firing, you know, electricity any differently because the, um, uh, it's not getting the same oxygen needs that it, it uh, it's not getting the same flow and oxygen that it needs. 
Um, we also like to do what's called a stress test um, a lot of times with these patients. And what that is, is effectively um, we are trying to um, see how a patient uh, does um, when their heart is under circumstances where um, they're, uh, you know, uh, using more oxygen. So, um, you know, some of these patients with CAD, again, they have no symptoms. And even when they're up, moving around, exercising, whatever, they're fine. They still have enough flow. Because remember, we talked about the intermittent claudication with PAD, that like when they're up walking around, things are already narrow, full of plaques. And then there's that more, uh, even more constriction that happens when they're um, getting exercise, which can lead to the intermittent claudication. So stress test is a lot looking for the same. It's trying to see, okay, what happens when we start working? So they put them on a treadmill or they can give them a medication that can stimulate stress or stress the heart out. And um, by doing that, um, they're seeing what the heart's response is. How does it handle it? So you could also kind of compare this to like the oral glucose tolerance test. Like how does insulin respond to glucose when it comes into the body for a diabetic? This is how does um, your heart respond to stress when there's less oxygen or it's working harder. Um, and so we're really going to be looking for changes. We're going to be looking for dysrhythmias. We're going to be looking for um, new onset chest pain, um, EKG changes, things like that. Um, and then the most invasive one would be what's called a cardiac cath. And that's where they go in. And we'll talk about this more. They go up through the groin and they are looking for um, blockages. They're looking for how narrow things are to uh, possibly perform interventions as well. Um, just kind of seeing like what's going on inside. So this is an activity I do with my students. It's some case studies and stuff where we kind of broke these down. But this is a great way to study is, is to create your own scenarios. I um, really start thinking about, okay, let's say I had a patient, their cholesterol was this, their troponin was this, like, what would I be doing? What would I be focusing on? Um, so it's great to put it in. And if you don't, um, you know, really feel like you can do that, case studies are a great, a great way to go. Really start looking at it. Because again, you can sit there and be like, oh, I have all the labs memorized, but then you put them in a scenario and your brain's like, wait, like, what do I do about these? So um, let's talk about cardiac cath. So there's a lot of names that you might hear when it comes to cardiac cath. You might hear cardiac catheterization. You might hear heart cath, angioplasty, PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention, balloon angioplasty, stenting, things like that. There's a lot of different names, but... Um, you know, just know that, you know, depending on what they're doing uh, or will need to do, sometimes they're just going in and looking and assessing what's going on. What does this patient need? And other times, you know, if there are actually, is there actual damage or if they go in and find, um, you know, a problem, they can go in and do an intervention and they can do things like removing excess plaque. Um, they can do what's called a balloon angioplasty, which is where they inflate a balloon to um, open up and um, kind of push the plaque up against the wall. So there's more space for flow. They can place a stent to keep um, arteries better open to allow for better flow too. Um, so I have some videos I usually show about this, um, but I highly recommend kind of watching videos about what a PCI is and um, what it looks like. Cause it, it's really hard. Like I can sit here and talk about it all day long, but until you visualize it and just know, yeah, I also have this video that kind of shows like different stuff that they can do in cath lab and different ways they get rid of clots, plaque and other stuff. So pretty cool stuff. Um, before a patient goes to car, um, anytime I'm talking about all these diagnostic tests and stuff like that, just remember that, you know, for the most of us nursing instructors, we don't really test deep over what the procedure is like in depth. Like we want to know you to know the basics because you're going to, you know, be talking to patients about these, um, you know, or they might ask questions. You want to know generally what's going to happen in the procedure. But um, the bigger thing is you want to know what your role is as the nurse. So before someone goes to the cardiac cath lab, what we're usually going to tell them is, uh, sorry, let me not tell them, what we usually want to um, look for is things like an uh, allergy to contrast dye. And that's because in the, ca the cath lab, they have to inject dye. And so um, we know we want to make sure they don't have an allergy there because that would be a contraindication. Um, there should be no food or fluid intake for six to 12 hours prior. Um, the doctor and stuff will decide this patient's not getting put to sleep. Usually in the cath lab, um, usually they're just, if they need to, they'll moderately sedate them, but a lot of times they can be wide awake for this. Um, still be okay. A lot of times they'll give them a little something just to kind of, um, ease the anxiety. Uh, we want to get baselines. Um, so pretty much when you look at baseline assessments, you want to think these are all the things that could go wrong later. So I want to get a baseline to see what they are now. So vital signs, seeing where they're starting, heart and breath sounds. Um, and then probably one of the most important ones is a neurovascular. Um, I could have an effect on this patient's distal pulses and like all the seven P's and one C. So I'm going to do very um, good thorough assessment on that. 
And then I also want to get some baseline labs. I want to get some cardiac biomarkers to see where they're starting in case there is some damage going on. Um, and then also check out the kidney function as well, um, because uh, the contrast dye can be really hard on the kidneys. So I want to see where they're at starting in case the kidneys do get hurt during this procedure. When I say hurt, I mean just that the contrast can um, is considered like a nephrotoxic drug. So um, after cardiac cath, so there's, a, of course, like I mentioned, one of the priority assessments is peripheral perfusion. So effectively, either in the femoral artery or in the radial artery is usually the two most common approaches. Um, they stick a sheath, which is just like a very big catheter um, up into um, that artery, and they follow this guide wire up into um, the heart to assess, look for things, et cetera. And then they're injecting dye, and then it lights up this picture. They're pretty much, there's a tech in there that's taking pictures, um, and it kind of gives a, it helps the, uh, they inject dye to see how far flow is. Like, it's pretty cool stuff. Like, if you ever get a chance to go in and see cath lab, it's definitely an interesting, um, interesting procedures to work, especially if you love the beautiful, beautiful heart. Um, but um, what can happen as a result is I have a catheter in the artery. Now this catheter gets removed, um, but because of when that catheter is removed in the artery, there can be swelling, hematomas can form, other things can happen. They can form clots because I've interrupted. Remember back in, we talked about DVTs. I know that was venous, but just know any break in an artery or a vein um, can cause inflammation, irritation, um, clots and stuff can form. So I want to be worried if I have, um, you know, going now thinking about PAD, if I have an artery that maybe has a blockage, what happens? I have decreased flow to my feet. So this is the same kind of thing where it's possible. I'm not saying it happens often or all the time, but it's possible to have a compromise or um, a deficit in my perfusion. Um, so for, if I'm doing in the femoral artery, I want to look at my dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial pulses. And I'm doing those seven P's and one uh, C check. Um, you know, sometimes even with these patients, we'll put like a pulse oximeter on their toe to make sure that they continue to get perfusion all the way down there. Uh, then there is the risk of bleed, uh, sorry. And then if it's a radial approach, we're going to do capillary refill and be checking um, their fingers and making sure that they have good capillary refill, um, good flow, color, temperature, et cetera. We also are going to be concerned about bleeding with these patients. Um, so um, I'm going to monitor, you know, I, I was telling my students that like back when I started as a nurse, we didn't have as many closure devices, or at least they weren't used as often, at least at the hospital I worked at. Um, and so um, what we did is, you know, and I worked night shift too. So it was a little different because during the day they can do this in the post-op part of cath lab. Um, but at night when patients would come to me um, that, you know, they would still have like this catheter that you see here, they would still have this in their groin. It will be my job to remove it. And then I'll have to hold pressure. Now this is in an artery and it's a big catheter. So I would have to hold pressure on average, you know, 30 to 45 minutes, if not more. Um, and so it's a long time and you have to hold occlusive pressure, like really strong pressure. So your hands get super tired. You got to work really hard. I had to kind of do this and um, it almost reminded me like, you know, when I was younger and used to play guitar in my, you know, rock band days, um, you know, I, um, you know, I had to kind of like practice because my hands would um, <laughs> got start to like get like a, a cramp in them. So all the fun. Um, needless to say. Um, what do you call them? We now have these closure devices that kind of help to um, seal off things a lot better for us than us holding manual pressure. But a lot of times you're going to see other devices um, or um, things that are going to help with that. Like sometimes we put sandbags or other things on a patient's groin to help to um, keep that pressure. Um, on top of the closure device. And then you can see in this picture, this is what's called a TR band. Um, and uh, what that does is it actually holds occlusive pressure. So I don't have to sit there and hold pressure on the patient's wrist. This is doing it for me. And it has a balloon inflated in it. And your job as the nurse, you'll actually have an order for this is it will tell you like you start, like the patient comes back then after a period of time when it's like, you know, we usually wait till their ACT, which is a clotting um, lab or another lab gets down to a certain level. Then we start deflating this balloon. We deflate it a little at a time. It'll be like deflate by two cc's. Now, if I deflate by two cc's, this is clear. So I look then if their bleeding starts happening after I'm deflating a little bit, I'm going to reinflate it. There's like a whole titration thing. It's like if bleeding occurs, inflate by one, you know, it's, it's a whole thing, but I'm pretty much usually playing this game where I'm slowly trying to deflate it. Eventually I can take that band off once the bleeding has stopped.
And um, the radial approach is definitely preferred when possible, when it is possible, because um, the, the femoral approach, they have to lie flat for four to six hours after um, uh, the procedure, whereas the radial, they're not limited. So when they have to lie flat after the procedure, usually these people are hungry, thirsty, want to use the bathroom, um, and they can't do that as easily after the um, groin access ones. Um, but yeah, so other things we're going to do as the nurse is look at uh, vital signs, changes in blood pressure and heart rate, which could be signs of bleeding. Um, we also want to monitor the sheath site. Um, and that's going to be that groin site or that radial site where usually in like, I mean, every hospital has different policies, but in general, it's like every 15 times four, every 30 times two, then every hour for about 24 or more hours. Um, so we're going to watch and what we're watching for is we're looking for bleeding. We're looking for, and I know a lot of people say infection, it's possible, it's less likely, um, but usually we look for bleeding. We look for what's called a hematoma, which is really like a hard, um, uh, what do you call them? A hard bruise that forms around it. And if they get that, it's really uncomfortable. We have to sit there and mash it and break it up so that um, it doesn't get worse. Oh, and it's so painful for them. I always uh, feels that it's always so, um, it's hard. Um, the, the, when you want to hold pressure on these, like we need to hold pressure because we're stopping them from bleeding. But I've actually seen patients before. Um, there was one time this person's sheath site would not stop bleeding. We actually had to call the um, cath lab surgeons to come, I um, mean, you know, the doctors to come. I don't know, I guess they're kind of like surgeons, but yeah, I'll call them doctors to come. And they were sitting there, like there's two of them sitting there and kind of looking at it, checking it out. And they started holding pressure. Um, and then it hurt. And this lady, she reached around and started smacking the doctor's butt. <laughs> And she was just like, she's like, get off of me. And um, he was like, ma'am, please stop smacking my butt. Like, you know, she, she kept thinking, she's like, I'm going to keep smacking your butt till you get off of me. You're hurting me. And, and he was like, I can't keep, take my hand off of this or you'll bleed to death. Like, please stop smacking my butt. <laughs> so um, just know, yeah, you know, it does. Uh, it, it's a hard thing when you're holding pressure and uh, then someone can uh, smack your butt very easily. So um, the struggle is real. <laughs> so I've been in some uh, compromising situations holding pressure too. It's no fun. Anyway, um, the fun of nursing. I know you can't wait to get out there into the field and experience all this for yourself. Um, we also, uh, you know, want to be looking and doing um, very frequent um, cardiovascular and neurological assessments. And, you know, a lot of that's going to be focused on like mental status, level of consciousness, making sure they're not having blood loss or any other issues. And like I mentioned, there will be bed rest for four to six hours um, post-procedure for people that have that groin or um, femoral, femoral ac uh, artery access. Um, I told you about the hematomas, the patients can also have dysrhythmias. So we want to watch that, especially if they had a procedure where we restored some perfusion, like, um, you guys don't need to know this at this level, but just know, like after, excuse me, after someone, um, has a heart attack, sometimes like their heart's awake, like we restored this block blockages and it's like, I can breathe. So it gets a little excited and it flutters a little bit. Sometimes you get some PVCs, um, but you know, it shouldn't be crazy frequent, but they can have some occasional or more frequent. And now I won't say more frequent, but, um, they can have some occasional, uh, PVCs. Um, and then, um, we also, the other thing we always want to look for is occlusion. So in other words, like, um, this would be, um, if a person, um, you know, we went in, we put a stent in a patient, but then all of a sudden they started to, um, the stent occluded, or maybe on one of their other arteries, they have a blockage that ended up like having a sudden rupture and, um, blockage of their coronary artery. So we want to look for newer returning symptoms. And when we get to angina, you know, this is why it's so important to know the symptoms someone came in with, um, cause we want to see, okay. Like I always ask people that you probably the first question is, is like, does this feel like what it felt like when you first came in? Because I want to kind of get to the bottom of um, what's going on. So I want to be assessing for if they had chest pain, what that feels like, etc. All right, so let's do an application question. So a nurse is caring for a client four hours post cardiac catheterization. Um, what assessment finding is most concerning? So this is saying maybe all of these are concerning and um, we need to figure out which one we need to report first, um, or uh, maybe some of these are normal and I'm just trying to pick out the one because um, it might, this normal it might look bad, but um, which one of these for this patient is either abnormal and needs to be reported, or if I don't report it could lead to the most chance of harm. So the first one is nurse takes vital signs and finds a blood pressure of 139 over 78. So for this one, I mean, their blood pressure is a little elevated, um, but it's not crazy high. It might be a little high afterward with pain and other things. Um, so I wouldn't say that I, that's incredibly concerning. It might be even expected. Um, the nurse visualizes the she site and finds mild bruising. So that word mild is a good cue for you because usually mild stuff is not stuff that's very concerning. Um, they can have bruising around the site. So we definitely want to keep that in mind. 
Um, nurse palpates the tissue around the sheath site and it is soft to touch. Well, this is what we want. We do not want that hard tissue or that hematoma. So when you think hematoma, think hard tissue. We should not, it should not feel hard. It should feel very soft right around that um, sheath site. Um, you have to palpate it. Patients hate it. They're like, ouch, but you always have to palpate it because you need to touch to feel that it's um, soft and not hard. Um, last but not least, client is having numbness and tingling to the right lower extremity. Ooh, so this is maybe a sign of a compromised perfusion or to their lower extremity. So this could be a sign of, you know, some blockages or things occurring after this procedure. So I'm going to say D is most concerning because it could be a sign that there is impending compromise. Um, so the most concerning thing now, maybe this might be okay, but this out of all of these choices, all the others are normal expected or actually what I want. This is the only one that's truly concerning or could be a sign of a problem. D. So medically, um, what are we going to do? We're going to do regular monitoring. Um, so now we're back, kind of back talking about CAD. Um, so regular monitoring is important with CAD uh, to make sure that uh, we are you know, keeping up and make sure they're not getting worse. Um, we're going to do things like medications, um, you know, to decrease plaques, uh, which is our cholesterol meds. We're going to talk about those next. Um, and um, they should, um, you know, we should see a decrease in cholesterol le levels. That's how I know that they're doing their job. We're also going to do medications to decrease clogging. So if you remember back when we talked about venous disorders, um, you know, what medications we want no cardiac events, no angina, no signs of a blood clot. So these, remember clogging, anti-clogging AC is going to be um, aspirin and clopidogrel or uh, my antiplatelets. So if you're thinking decreasing the amount of plaques, it's cholesterol medicines. Um, remember platelets, as a, as a reminder, you antiplatelets, the way that they work is platelets hang together normally. Um, they like to stick together. When they stick together, then they go out looking to form plates at issues where there's broken tissue or breaks and other things. What can happen with plaques is plaques can form little breaks in them um, and little clots can form. And then platelets are like, ooh, I want to go over there and form a plate on that. And so they go over and add to things and make um, clogs in the arteries. So um, we worry about them clogging arteries. Um, so anti-cholesterol meds um, and um, anti-platelets as well. Uh, diet and exercise is an important part of CAD. You're going to see there's nothing in cardiac where it's just like, take this medicine, that's it. Everything's going to be about modifying risk factors and I'm um, trying to get to the bottom of things. Like I said, smoking is probably one of the best things that you can stop or do. If you stop it, you significantly just decrease your risk, high blood pressure and diabetes management as well, making it better. You can't change that you have it, but you can make it better. Oh, uh, this is just an activity me and my students did in class about risk factors, but let's get into... Uh, what do you call it? Meds. And I almost feel like I want to split this up. I think I'm going to pause here and I'm going, mm, let's see how much more we have. Yeah. Mm, now nah, I'm going to just keep on going. I'm going to keep on going for this time. Anyway. Um, so let's talk about these meds. So there's a few cholesterol meds, but the great thing about cholesterol meds is, is that they're very similar. They have very similar side effects and things like that, especially the big ones. Um, so if you can kind of remember in general, cholesterol meds can cause these problems. Um, you know, it can help keep it together. So the most common cholesterol med you're going to see given is going to be statins. Um, and so, um, with statins, the big thing that we worry about is the liver because it can lead to liver damage. So they might need periodic monitoring of their liver enzymes. We want to um, ask about uh, muscle pain because what can happen is just a result of the way this medication works. It can lead to breakdown of the muscles, which can lead to this um, process called rhabdomyolysis. Um, and so um, uh, with that, it can be life-threatening. It can lead to kidney failure. So we want to watch closely. So some patients report muscle pain with this and they're fine, but anytime a patient has muscle pain, we want them to tell their doctor because um, it could be normal or it could be a sign of a problem. So um, they should always report muscle pain. Um, and there's also the risk of getting a, ra a topical rash. Um, some people do get that with their statins. So um, you know, we, um, definitely, you know, anytime we're looking at symptoms to report, we want to think about things that are going to be nagging or annoying and might cause a patient not to take their medicine or ones that could be sign of a problem. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, we're going to check their liver enzymes periodically, and, um, we're going to be looking out for that muscle pain. Um, the next medication is, are the fads or the fibric acid derivatives. Um, so we, um, again, um, you know, with this, it's going to look exactly like statins. It can cause liver problems. They need to report muscle pain. They need to look for a rash. 
Um, the only other thing to know is that these fads interact with a lot of other medications. So be careful with medication interactions. And especially if someone's on a fad and a statin, which it's possible, it maybe like you know, most of the time, I haven't seen too many patients on both. Um, but if it is given with a statin, it can inter, um, actually increase that risk of that rhabdomyolysis or the muscle breakdown. So um, you want to be, you really don't want to give these with statins because it really significantly in, uh, increases that risk for problems. Um, other cholesterol meds, um, here are three different other ones. There's omega-3 fatty acids. So think like fish oil. Um, you know, these are generally well tolerated. They just have like a taste, like they literally can taste like fish um, and um, they can cause GI upset. Um, but as a whole, that can especially help to decrease your triglycerides if your triglycerides are a problem. Um, there's niacin, which um, will remind you kind of like, I think the ni in there, like nitroglycerin, where they can get flushing. They can also get GI side effects or orthostatic hypotension. Um, but what you want to think about with niacin um, is like the most uncomfortable thing people complain about is the flushing. They can take aspirin or an NSAID 30 minutes prior, and it decreases the inflammatory response, um, which can decrease and prevent some of that flushing. Um, then last but not least, there's what's known as bile acid sequestrants. And, um, you know, these are all the ones that have like coli in them. Um, and so, um, they have a similar stuff to the omega-3 fatty acids where there can be a taste thing and a GI upset. But the other thing you want to keep in mind with this medication is, is that it can actually interact or, um, interfere with absorption of other meds. So we don't want to take it at the same time. Um, so it's kind of like those GLP one receptor agonists for diabetes, where it changes like your motility. These are not changing your motility, but they're changing your absorption of, um, cholesterol. And so that's great for the cholesterol, but then it can also change your absorption of other meds. So we don't want to take other medications one hour before or three to four hours after. Um, and then it can cause constipation. So fluids and fiber. Oh, there's a little typo. Fluids and fiber or cholesterol meds. All right. Sorry, I'm always taking notes, trying to improve my PowerPoints. So anyway. Um, so th those are a lot of meds back to back, but just know, like, you know, again, only put on a note card or a flashcard. Um, what is important and pertinent to the nursing, you know, realm and stuff like that, less about the patho and um, really focus on what's different, not what's the same, like general symptoms, like everything's going to cause headache and GI stuff. But if I need to take it with food because it causes GI upset, then you want to note these things. Um, speaking of taking things with food, let's just also remember aspirin. Cause remember I want anti-cholesterol medicines or, you know, um, cholesterol medicines to help decrease that, but I also want antiplatelets. So some reminders about aspirin, we talked about it in, um, the vascular disorders is the 81 milligrams. That's your prophylactic dose. It's not for pain. It's to prevent cardiac problems, prevent clogs. Um, so the platelets don't stick together and form so many clogs. It can cause GI upset, especially GI bleeding. It can also lead to hearing loss or hearing problems. Um, at very high doses. So they should report any bleeding, hearing loss problems. Um, if they're going to have procedures, um, they need to let their physician know they're on aspirin. Um, taking it with food can decrease some of those GI symptoms. And um, we also want to always do bleeding precautions. I had bleeding precautions under my DVT um, PowerPoint education. So um, diet recommendations and exercise recommendations for those with CAD, we like heart healthy, low sodium diet. We'll talk more about the DASH diet when we get to hypertension. Uh, we want to decrease uh, the amount of saturated fats and high cholesterol foods um, to help with that cholesterol issue. Remember, we're pretty much trying to fight a plaque problem and a narrowing problem. The narrowing could be from hypertension, things like that. So kind of treating that problem diet wise and also treating the uh, too much fat problem. Um, red meat is generally no bueno um, for uh, heart disease. We want less red meat intake. Uh, we like our white meats and, um, you know, like baked meats versus anything fried or processed. Um, we like complex carbs over simple carbs, um, especially helps if they have diabetes and things like that. And increasing fiber is great for heart health. Um, exercise, we, and you know, uh, I always tell students like you're going to see different stuff. Like one thing, like let's say someone has CAD, hypertension, and some vascular issues, you might see different exercise things like, oh, flexibility, strength training, just don't generally want to get them moving. They should be moving every day, you know, for around 30 minutes. Um, they shouldn't be doing anything too vigorous or crazy, especially or build up to it, especially if they've never exercised before, do things that they like, um, but just don't get too hung up like, oh, CAD weight training. And then you see, oh, wait for um, CSA, they said to do this. Like, I mean, it's all the same stuff. We want them to get up, get moving, walking is great exercise. We want to moderate, which means that when they're exercising, they can't breathe and talk at the same time. All right.
And last but not least, um, our overall goals here for CAD are to prevent, modify, or slow down the coronary artery disease. Because again, this is like a precursor to worse things. So um, we, as the nurse, are going to provide screenings. We're going to look for those risk factors, those modifiable and not mon eh, non-modifiable ones. Um, we want to screen people and see like who's high risk and try to um, get help early and get those plaques down, um, get them on an antiplatelet, get them changing their lifestyle. Um, we want to teach them about how to reduce risk factors and make lifestyle modifications. Um, it definitely is good to take some time in cardiac to think about risk factors, like how am I going to help make the cholesterol better and not just medications, but other changes. How am I going to um, help with diabetes? If someone has diabetes, how can I make that better? Um, et cetera. Um, we want them to always know the signs and symptoms of a heart attack. So we want to know, okay, here's the next step right now. You just have plaques. What is it going to be like if you start to get blockages? Um, and then medication teaching just for safety and other things. And then, like I mentioned, managing other chronic things like hypertension, diabetes, um, high cholesterol, all those things um, can help to prevent more complications from CAD. Anyway, that's it for CAD. Angina's coming up next. I'll see you there.